Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have a special guest on. I actually... Uh, read his first book. Well, I don't know if his first book, but the first book I read of his is called Willpower. Dif- Willpower doesn't work. And uh, I honestly never thought one that I would uh, meet him Two that he would be on my show. So I'm super, super pumped about this. Lots of <laughs> questions. Uh, but he's written a new book called personality isn't permanent. And we're going to be discussing a little bit about that. Uh, I know you're going to get so much and get uh, out of this. And you're going to want to get this book immediately as it uh, flows off the shelves. But if you want to go back and listen to my first book review of his Willpower Doesn't Work book, go back to episode 96 and you'll be able to uh, hear about my thoughts of that book and you'll probably want to get that book as well. So his name is Benjamin Hardy. He is an organizational psychologist and best-selling author of Willpower Doesn't Work. Um, He has a blog that is read by millions, been featured on Forbes, Fortune, CNBC, Cheddar, Big Think, and tons of other things. He's a regular contributor to Inc. and Psychology Today magazines. Um, If you know what Medium is, it's kind of a blog site. He's uh, one of the most popular writers on there, Um, speaks worldwide, trains, um, all types of things. This is, uh, it's really funny, actually, the first phase of psychology that I was interested in um, as an individual, when I studied psychology, was industrial organizational psychology, and then it, then it moved and morphed into neuropsychology, then biochemistry, and went went a bunch of different ways. But um, I love this idea of organizational psychology and, and what it brings to brings to individuals, because that's really for me the the main thing about psychology is how do we help people understand themselves better, and if we can help them understand themselves better, we can heal the the world. That, that's my opinion of psychology. Um, and so go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, do you like being called Benjamin or Ben? What's your preferred? I know it says you just that. call me Ben. Ben? Okay. <laughs> that's cool. Cool. So uh, Ben, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more in depth and then tell us the story of where you first found your legacy and why and what kind of got you over that point to actually go chase your dreams regardless of any opposition. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So aside from everything else, you know, he said, basically kind of the core, core things going on in my life right now is, so I finished my PhD in organizational psychology last year. And uh, in 2018, my wife and I adopted three kids from the foster system, which was amazing, wild. Uh, actually becoming foster parents is really what led, uh, led me to writing Willpower Doesn't Work. And then my wife actually got pregnant with twins the month after we adopted our kids. So in 2018, we adopted three kids and had twins. It was a cool year, crazy year, five kids. Um, she may be pregnant again, which is a little crazy. But uh, yeah, I just uh, we live in Orlando now. My wife's a huge Disney buff, although we can't go to Disney at the moment. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of me. Just love writing. As far as a story, um, so when I decided to, I guess you could say, bet on myself or go big on, on the goals and the dreams, and, and we will talk a lot about how to strategically do that in this conversation because there's a lot of really good science behind how to become your desired future self. It's a really fun area of research going on right now in psychology. But let's see here. So when I was serving a church mission, I, I read a lot of really cool books. Uh, I read a ton of obviously like religious books, but I was reading all sorts of places. I was reading business, self-improvement. I got permission to do so by the way. Um, cause I was reading so much and, um, I really, and I wrote in my journal a lot. I was, I was writing in my journal so much during this period of time. And I learned how to one thing reframe all the negative experiences I had in the past. Cause I had a lot of tough experiences growing up, but I also learned how to use my journal and really my imagination to strategize and create my future. 
Um, and it was really through this process of reading all these amazing books, you know, analyzing the authors and thinking about my future self that I really decided that I was going to become a, a professional author. Like that was when I conceptualized it in my mind. I didn't actually know what that would look like, whether I'd be like writing, you know, more like spiritual style books or business. I didn't really know what the outcome would be, but I thought I'm going to start writing books. Uh, came home from that experience, started studying psychology. And it was really in 2015 that I, I started to bet big on myself. Uh, this was during the first year of my PhD program. And one of the, so I, I really began to clarify who my future self was at that point. And this was about three or four, like four or five years, no, like four or five years after I got home from the mission experience. But I really determined that I wanted to be a professional author writing business books slash self-help, you know, but business books and psychology books. And I wanted to be writing for the big firms, like the big, the big five publishing companies. And so what I did is ultimately I decided to set a single goal, which was to get a six figure book deal. And what, with that goal, uh, I then just went for it. I started investing big in my future identity. I started, uh, I started studying online courses about how to write viral content. I bought a, a website. My domain name was, just, I remember it was 800 bucks. And it was like when we were in graduate school, like that freaked us out. You know, like that was, I was making $13,000 a year as a first year graduate student. And so like to invest the 800 bucks was like, my wife was like, you've been saying that you want to write ever since I've known you. Like, is this for real? And I was like, but I, I believe that investment leads to commitment. And so I, I started to really start investing. And I, then at that point forward, I started to just own the future identity, which was that I was a professional writer. And then because of that, I accelerated my success. And, and, and I don't believe that you ever plateau. Like once you reach a level, like your future self has different goals than your current self. And so once I got to the point where I wanted to be now, my future self or the person I am now, which is the future self of my former self, but now that I'm at this level, my goals are different, you know, and so now I've got to recommit to uh, a new future. And so it's an ongoing process, but it's a blast. But yeah, I'd say 2015 is when I really decided I'm doing this. And I started investing money into the goal, started being public about it, started to just tell people that this is what I was going to do, stopped being ashamed of the goal, stopped, just, I just started owning it fully and started failing and started going through uh, the practice process of becoming your, becoming who you want to be. That is awesome. I love it. So we're going to... I took some notes here because there's some things I want to ask you about your kind of your beginning experience. I love that you took the time to, to read. I'm curious, are you a, are you a speed reader? How do you read or just very, very fast at reading and retention? How does that work? Cause I, the reason I ask, I read, I used to read books physically and it took me forever to get through them. Like I've had to reread pages so many times. Like this is not going to work. So I switched to audible and audible is a life savior for me because I can get through a lot more content. Um, and retention is good, but still not fantastic. So how were you, uh, how, what was your method of, of consumption and how, how fast were you at that consumption? Uh, I would say method of consumption used to be similar to yours, far more physical books, now far more audio books. Um, Retention, so memory has a lot to do with imagination, as weirdly as that sounds. Memory has a lot to do with thinking about things. And so, for example, if you read or even just listened to, let's just say you read for 20 minutes, you would remember so much more if you took three minutes after that just to write about what you read. Like literally, like it's similar to studying in school, but like if you just wrote what you got out of that um, and what you want to get out of that or what you're going to do because of it, literally by taking two or those two or three minutes may be worth more than the 20 minutes because you're actually thinking about what you want to do because of it. And so it's like the same if you go to a conference, uh, like a two or three day conference, if you don't spend 20 or 30 minutes afterwards to like write down like the five to 10 things that you really got out of it and that you're going to focus on because of it, then you're going to actually forget almost all of what you learned at the conference. It's all going to blend together and blend into your life. And then you're going to actually have a hazy memory. And so I would say my journaling process uh, is really why I can retain so much. It's just like, it's just like becoming conscious about what you want to remember because of what you just read or, or listen to in this case. And I listen to more audio books than anything else as well now. Yeah. But those two or three minutes will be worth a lot to you, man. <laughs> no, I, I believe you. So that's actually why I, uh, when I started my podcast, um, one of the things that I was recognizing was I was going through probably a, a new book a week on audible and I, I was applying small things throughout it, but not in any great detail. And I was like, man, what, what am I actually retaining from this? And so that's actually why I started my, the, the Wednesday book review aspect of my podcast that I've since discontinued. But, um, 
I was doing it so that, hey, I was going to come out and say, this is what I learned from the book. This is what I'm implementing from reading this book. And this is why I would recommend the book to you. So then I had an audio form because, again, writing is not my strongest suit. But audio, I was like, hey, I can do a book review about this. So I would finish a book on like Tuesday, write a few notes about what I want to talk about. And then Wednesday, I would do my, my book reviews. So now I have audio versions of about 100 yeah books. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Teaching is obviously a way fast way to retain something. So the fact that you're teaching the concepts that you learned would force you to think about it a lot harder and re- retain it more. So I think that, that I bet you're retaining more now that you're doing that than you used to. Yeah, no, significantly. I love that. Uh, this, this principle I think is, I, I forget, I think it's called like what the Pareto principle or whatever, where it's like 80, 20. Uh, but putting in this 80% of your 20 minutes of reading um, but if you're not taking those three to five minutes afterwards, the three to five minutes is what has the biggest impact. Yes, you need to be exposed to the 80% of the content. You have to have the exposure. But if you're not taking the 20% of the time to actually like maximize it, it's, it's almost useless. And that can go for any aspect of your life, your day. Like, are you spending the time to pre-program your day at night and in the morning? Are you thinking about, hey, how are these things going to go? It's a small thing to envision a process. Um, it's like, think of dreaming. I was this morning I woke up and I was like, Hey honey, what were your dreams? What were my dreams? And it eight hours worth of dreams, you know, and we can summarize it in five minutes. I'm like, yep, that was a trip, but I'll probably not forget those dreams because now I just talked about them to my wife and they were weird. <laughs> um, but I think so, so important is those, those three or five minutes of prep time or whatever it is, a 20 minute, 20% of prep time in whatever you're doing in life, make sure that's a part of whatever, it is, whatever it is you choose to do. Um, any, any comments on that? Yeah, because we're talking about prep time versus actually like, um, the word in, in learning is actually, oh my goodness. I can't believe I can't remember this right now. And there's a, there's a word for what you do after you've learned something. Um, it'll come to me in a minute, but the prep time is actually key too, which is learning with a purpose. So like, obviously you just stick on the audible, you just cruise, you're listening. It's interesting. But if you actually Generally, if you're if you're learn if you take literally one to two minutes beforehand to say what do I want to get out of this or why am I reading this or you know you you frame your perspective before you go into it you're going to get a lot more out of it because you're going to be a conscious learner so like it's better to it's better to learn things for a purpose than just generally consume information and so when I'm listening to books like whether it's a even if it's a biography it's like what attributes of this person do I want to get? Like what, you know, so you train your focus because in psychology it's called selective attention, but your, your eyes, you know, Dan Sullivan, who's the founder of strategic coach, he says your eyes can only see and your ears can only hear what your brain is looking for. And so it's your job to train your brain as far as what you're trying to find so that you can mine your information or mine your experiences so that you can actually get what you want to. So you can actually relevantly learn versus just have a total bunch of information that you have no clue what to do with. And most of which you won't even have access to because you'll have forgotten most of it. Yeah, no, I love it. And I think, so, so there's a few things. Oh man, this is, this is so great. But the one thing that I recognize when you said you're reading is you're analyzing authors. And th- this concept, again, is going to go into everything in your life. If you properly already set forth where you want to go, what your goal is, how you want to move forward as an individual, how you want to become or who you want to be or who, who your future self is, as we'll get into, um, then what happens is everything in life, doesn't matter if you're going to the movies, doesn't matter if you're having a conversation with uh, a loved one or a business partner or a client doesn't matter where you are everything in life you're now looking for and your mind is tuned into what is a way that I can anchor this my future self to me right now so I can get closer to my future self and so the this goes into what many people would call the law of attraction and it's an interesting thing because they say well I think a lot of people think the law of attraction applies to um, I'm gonna think about something And it's going to, the thing that I want that I'm attracting per se is going to be closer to me and it's going to move closer to me because I'm thinking about it. When I believe it's actually the reverse, the law of attraction has nothing to do with other objects moving towards you, but rather you identifying and moving closer to those objects swifter because that is what your mind is attracted to. Um, I love that. Kind of a flip on the, what the general. I think that makes a lot more sense. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, basically what the research shows, so there's a concept in psychology called deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is essentially intentional learning. Uh, it's what's required to become world-class or an expert at something. Um, and there's a great book called peak on the subject, but, um, in order, so 
deliberate practice is different from routine study. So for example, if you go to the gym every single day and engage in the same workout every single day, like you're in a routine mode, you're basically just doing what you did yesterday and you have no specific goals. And so your workout's not necessarily targeted towards those goals. A lot of people just go to the gym to go to the gym to maintain where they're currently at. Uh, and I think that that's how a lot of people learn or gain information. But deliberate practice is different. Deliberate practice means that you're, first off, it's called deliberate for a reason, but you, have a, you can't actually engage in this type of practice without a very clear sense of who your future self is. Um, you know, so for example, Olympians would like visualize and imagine their future self, like, you know, winning gold and like being at this amazing level. I know that Kobe Bryant spent so much time like seeing himself like play like Michael Jordan, you know, um, but you can't engage in a, so the goal or the vision always shapes the process. And so you can't engage in a purposeful process without knowing where that goal is going. And the process is based on the goal. And so if your vision is really clear on who you want to be as far as that future self, then you can gain, engage in a process and engage in learning that will get you there, that will translate into who you're trying to become. Um, if you're not clear on the future self, therefore, if you're just reading a book to read it, rather than using it to become who you want to be, then you're not, then it's like going to the gym for li literally just going to the gym. It's not getting you any better. And it may even actually be getting you worse because you're training yourself to like atrophy versus train yourself to actually focus and go somewhere. That's huge. Training you can well, well, atrophy. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just think that's crazy. I, like that mindset of training. I think you are atrophy. Sorry, that that was broken up a little bit. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, yeah, I was just saying. There's the idea of training yourself to atrophy. People think you're either moving forward. Well, I would say you're either moving forward or backwards. But oftentimes, people think motion in general is forward. But you could still be like motion, like creating motions in your life, creating routines in your life that actually are moving you backwards rather than forwards. And if you're not intentional about where you're going, I, and this is maybe a crass example, but uh, it's really funny to me still. I have a lot of friends on Facebook and one time uh, I got into a, a group that was maybe not my ideal crowd and somebody reached out to me and was like, hey, is, uh, do you think pornography is bad? And I was like, I don't know. What's your objective, right? Like, for, for me, my objective is not to be addicted to pornography and not to be whatever. So like it, it wouldn't serve me. But if your goal is to be addicted to pornography, it'd be really difficult to do that if there was no pornography, right? So like, is it bad? That's a relative, that's a relative question about what's your objective and movement is movement. Uh, but the direction you're going could still be uh, atrophy if, towards your goal if you aren't intentional about it. I love it. I mean, I genuinely believe that your identity is based upon your goals. A lot of people are not necessarily clear on what their goals are. They haven't fully defined them, but they still have goals. Every behavior is goal focused. Like for example, going to fill up the gas in your car. You may not consider that a goal, but you actually have a goal. It's to fill up your gas. <laughs> and like literally going to the bathroom, every human behavior is goal driven. Um, and, and so people, every person's identity is literally based upon their goals. Um, it could be to pay the bills. It could be, to sit, fit in with their friends. But once you start to live intentionally, you need to define who, you know, it's, it's impossible to clarify and define your identity if you don't know what your goals genuinely are. And part of that with what you just said, which I really like is to question your current goals. Like, you know, is this goal worth it? You know, like I agree with you that it's all based on what you're trying to accomplish, you know, pornography or, or, or eating donuts. Like it's, it's all relative to the goal. Um, and so once you define the goal, then it becomes relevant as far as what's good or bad or what's, what's effective versus non-effective. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. So I want, I want to move on because I have other questions that I want to ask you. <laughs> we're gonna, there's no Whatever way you want, man. Happy to. I love it. No way we're getting to all of these questions. But um, before we move on to more in depth about your book, because I want to dissect this, but when it came to journaling, what do you feel like if you were to say, these were the main questions that I asked myself, uh, when reframing my past, what were what was that process like from a journaling perspective? Because I have my own four questions that I teach um, everybody I can about these questions because they saved my life. But I'm curious, what are your questions that you were asking yourself to reframe? Interesting. Um, I mean, reframing is really about all. It's re, it's about recontextualizing. It's it's the it's the recognition that context matters more than content, and so you know you can only like the meaning of anything is based on the context of that thing. Um, and so for me, I'm always just trying to reframe like different perspectives. So for example, 
my father was a drug addict when I was a young kid. Like, so asking myself, like, what, you know, as one example, like, what are the, what are the good things that actually came out of this? Like, who would I be if this didn't happen? Um, what was my father's perspective? You know, like literally just getting different perspectives. Um, I really like shifting things from negative to positive because, but also just exposing yourself to it. Like when you, the goal is, is that the past is information, not emotion. Like if the past is emotion, then it's still driving you. But if it's information, because you've actually focused on it, you've learned about it, you haven't avoided it, and you've gotten broader context and understanding and more maturity, then you can really use the past as information and learning to make better decisions in the future. Uh, so I just try to, I try to turn it into information. It's like, what can I learn from this? Like what, you know, why did this happen? <laughs> like, and, uh, and, and understanding that my current view of why it happened is not the real reason why it happened. It's just my current view. Um, my view is very limited based on my current views and context. And so, um, you know, another good question is like, how would my future self view this experience? Or, or what, would, what would someone else view this? How would someone else view this experience? Um, and so just, I don't know, I don't have any specific questions. I mean, those are some of them, you know. I, I think the future self asking you how, you, how would your future self view this is a good one. And even how would your future self view, feel about your former self? Or what would, you, what would your future self say to the, the former you that was going through that experience? I love it. So here are my four questions that I, I'm actually in the process I love it. Let's of, hear them. Uh, of creating a journal for these four questions. Uh, I'm all about journaling. I, I got to, after all of my reading of books, what I mostly learned was reading books is good, but uh, my frustration of when I'm trying to convey information is unless there's journaling included, then there's virtually no way for me to guarantee or, or as close to guarantee as I can that the person consuming my content is actually going through the same experience that I went through. And so all of my books are uh, probably half reading and half journaling, if not more weighted on the journaling side, because my goal is to create transformation in these people's lives um, and not just give them content. But that being said, so my four questions are, <laughs> anytime somebody's going through something, and these are what saved my life, um, what are the facts, right? So um, what, from my view, what factually happened? Removing all emotion, right? So exactly what he said, turning it into information, not emotion. What, what are the facts about what happened? So that's the, the first thing that he said about information. Then exposure. So for, for me, in the form of exposure, I say, hey, how do I feel about those facts? How did those facts make me feel then? How do I feel now? What feelings am I having because of what factually happened. Because those feelings are all mine. They're all my ownership. I can't assign those to anybody else. How I feel is entirely up to me. So that's the first, first and second question. Third question is what might also be true, which is exactly what he's asking, where he's asking, hey, what are the other perspectives that I could view this from? What is something, like what was my dad's perspective? What was my sibling's perspective? What was, what was I just completely unaware of? Um, so what are the other perspectives? And then the last question that I have people ask themselves is what, what, what am I grateful for out of this experience and what am I going to do because of this experience? So what I, the reason I asked him before I said these is because success leaves clues and people who have learned to reframe, although we all have different words, reframing is, is a basic process. I mean, it totally, it's, it's not, not, it's, 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 it's something you get better and better at. Like you better reframe how you dealt with today. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's literally something you've got to get good at daily and even like moment by moment if you're struggling or just in general. So, so to, to follow up on this question, cause I haven't really asked in a while. Uh, I know research changes. So this is my perspective uh, from what I studied in neuropsychology, but my belief is that you can literally rewrite your past from a neuro uh, neural connection pathway process. And I, because everything comes down to how are we viewing those experiences? What are the lenses? And so if my, my opinion is if your past is too difficult to deal with, right, it's too painful to even sit down and go through those four questions. If you get in the habit of reframing the day to day things and going through the same process, then the new, you could call it a freeway or the new pathway of your brain, then um, starts to view all experience through this, um, this pathway of 
these questions, facts, feelings, other perspectives, what am I learning? Then when you do turn around and look at those painful experiences, without you having to go through the pain, the pain is all removed and now you're viewing this past experience from this perspective and it's instant gold moving forward. That's my perspective. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, you're going to like when you get past chapter one. Um, so yeah, I mean, I talk about in the book how the past is fiction and about how obviously it's a story, it's a perspective. So Stephen Covey said, we don't view the world as it is, but we view the world as we are. Uh, that's exactly true of the past. You don't view the past as it is, but you view the past from your current narrative or from the current perspective. That's just fundamentally true. So from a memory perspective, memory is not an objective filing cabinet. Every time you retrieve a memory, that memory changes because it changes based on your current situation, your emotions, your lens, your environment. And so the more you think of a memory, the more that memory integrates. And by the way, the integration is the word I was looking for from before, as far as integration is what you do after you read a book. But every time you, every time you look at a memory, it integrates aspects of the present in it. And obviously, you view the past from the perspective of your identity. And so one of the big problems with traumatic memories is, is that an event occurred and you had an emotional response. So in, in, emotional, in an emotional sense, there's a primary response and then there's a secondary response. The secondary one often doesn't happen um, because that's where the reframe is. The secondary one, so if you have an initial response, which is this is terrible or I mean, whatever you're feeling, and then you come up with a narrative as a result, they call it a cognitive commitment, you know? So an event happens, an emotion happens, and then it's followed by a thought. And that thought is often a commitment, such as, wow, I'm a terrible person. Like, for example, if, some, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're told by a math teacher that you're bad at math, or just you fail a test and you feel horrible about it, you might think to yourself, I can't do this anymore. That's the essence of trauma. And if you don't then reframe that experience, then you're going to then have that new identity, which is going to drive your future goals. Uh, and you're going to, as you said, avoid it. And so it, it's important to realize that that memory is flexible. Like you can change not only the, the emotion of the memory, but you can also change the, the nature and even the narrative of the memory. You can even forget the memory. Like think about it. If there's something that you still remember, that means it was pretty significant and meaningful. Um, a lot of the things that happened weren't significant enough for you to like, I mean, obviously all the memories are there, but it's not significant to matter, you know? And so like if, you, if, if your math teacher told you you weren't good at math and you just you were able to reframe it, you probably forget about that. It wouldn't still be defining your future in that realm. And so um, I'm going to tell a quick story because I think this is super important to understand when it comes to, to memory changing and also just changing your narrative. But it's everything you've said is crucial. Uh, and I would, I'll, I'll recommend a book, by the way. The book is Too Soon Old, Too Late Smart. It's by Gordon Livingston. Too Soon Old, Too Late Smart. Gordon Livingston. Uh, I quote him a few times in Personalities Permanent. He's dead now, but he was a really smart psychiatrist. And he talks a lot about narrative and story and about how you can change, you know, literally your past is up to you. That, that's, a, that's a great thing to understand. But anyways, here's the story. So the story is my mother-in-law who recently went to the gym. She went to the gym and was just exercising. This was probably seriously like two weeks ago. And there was a very overweight woman in the gym exercising, like very overweight, very obese. And she was wearing very tightly fitted clothing, like such that it was quite revealing. Um, and it was awkward, super awkward for everyone that was there, to be honest with you. Um, but as it comes, my wife or my mother-in-law is working out next to this woman. And they're sitting there chatting because my she's pretty chatty. And she finds out that this woman over the last several months has lost 150 pounds. So like, does that, does that change anything? Yeah, now everybody's looking at her. If everybody knew that story, now everybody would be proud of her and excited that she's there and completely change their perspective of what yeah who, what and who that person is yeah that's what happened to my mother-in-law she went from one second being a little bit critical judgmental to like being freaking inspired and then going and telling everyone in the gym did you know that this woman's lost 150 pounds it just shows that the content matters far less than the context that the that this woman you're not just seeing this woman you're seeing her context and it's not just the woman you're seeing it's you're seeing the whole situation and so when it comes to your past you're viewing it from a context. Often, if you haven't taken the time to like develop and mature your perspectives, you're seeing it from the perspective and from the context as like your 10 year old self or your 15 year old self, a very less mature version of you. Um, like your future self is going to see your, your past differently. Hopefully your future self hopefully sees the whole world differently than you do right now because your current views are very limited right now. Um, 
that's why they say it's really important to view your your past self and your future self as totally different people from who you currently are because your future self is not going to be the same. Um, but in getting more context, again, that's what I did with my dad. I asked questions. Dad, what was your perspective like during this time? Why, what led you to this experience? Like gaining context and perspective allows you to have more perspective and empathy. Like I was able to have a lot of empathy and understanding toward my dad and what led him to that. Also able to have a lot more perspective and empathy towards my former self. I was 11, 12 years old. Uh, I shouldn't need, I'm not that person anymore. Like I shouldn't judge that person based on my current self. It's just like history. Um, you shouldn't judge people from like generations gone by based on your current context because they were in a different situation. Um, like I'll give an example. In a recent email that I sent, I used the word viral. I was talking about an article or something that went viral and I got a lot of heat to be honest with you because of what's currently going on with coronavirus. Like, dude, you shouldn't use that word right now. And like three weeks ago, that word wouldn't have mattered. But in this context, that word now has different energy. And so when you're going back, you want to recontextualize it. You do that through journaling, but there's also a really more, uh, just as powerful of a way to do it. So there's a book called Healing the Tiger, um, Healing the Tiger, or sorry, uh, what is it called? It's by Peter Levine. Uh, it's called Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma, Healing the Tiger, or sorry, Waking the Tiger, Healing Trauma. But in that book, Peter Levine says, trauma isn't what happens to you. It's what you hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. So wow. it, think about it. Think about it. Someone who's becoming expert at something, world class, they have to have coaches. They have to have mentors. You know, you're a financial advisor. There's going to be ups and downs that people are going to go through in their life. And if they don't have an empathetic witness, if they don't have someone that can help them reframe and help them encourage them towards the bigger vision, then they're going to hit some glass ceiling. They're going to hit some event. They're going to fail a test or they're going to, they're going to, they're going to bomb something. Like, for example, even though you've read Willpower Doesn't Work, uh, to, in a lot of ways, that was a bomb for me. Like, it didn't, I didn't hit my goals on that book. I mean, it's been quite successful, but I, I, I framed it for a long time as a failure until I'm now launching this new book because I didn't hit my goals. And if you don't have an empathetic witness or if you don't have a support cast, if you don't have people around you that can help you reframe and that, you're not in, and that you can talk to about and then you can get their encouragement, get their support and help, help them be, help, sometimes they'll need to help remind you of your future self and that your current emotions are just a reaction to what happened and that you can get through those and that you need to get through those. Um, those are some ways to reframe the past. But the past is a story and you get to choose what that story is very much. And as you gain, gain more context and as you gain more flexibility and as you get moving in your future, like you said, you, we would generally view the past and frame it in a positive way, in, an emotion, in a non-emotional, informational way that you are using to propel your future forward. Absolutely. I love it. Um, everybody needs to go get this book. Um, personality isn't permanent. Uh, as he made reference to, I've only read the first chapter um, due to um, maybe that's all I remember getting, but that's okay. Um, I'm excited. We'll, we'll get you more. We'll get yeah. you more, brother. <laughs> I'm excited for the whole thing. I'm excited for the Audible book. Um, but uh, we'll it, it is just the whole concept. This is kind of honestly my whole life's work is helping people understand this whole entire concept from a religious perspective um, because that's what's near to my heart is helping people understand uh, Christ and being able to reframe things that happen in life and uh, on a deeper level there. But well, who's, who's the ultimate, who's the ultimate empathetic witness, right? Exactly. Exactly. And if we don't understand that or don't know how to um, separate off, in my opinion, experiences that have happened um, in life because of other people who are quote unquote imperfect, um, then we end up rejecting aspects of life because we think we make this emotional connection to that imper imperfect um, vessel. But in reality, just because somebody misused a principle doesn't mean that the principle is bad or wrong or has any detriment to us long term. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on all I'm with you on all counts. Uh, yeah. I think that I think it's exciting to know that the past can change. I think it's exciting to know that your future self is not the same person as you are and that they're going to see the world differently, even their past differently. And that we can change and that we shouldn't over over well, if we should first off know that our current, our current identity and our, also our current perspective is incredibly limited and in that it can expand. And when you don't hold too tightly to how you see things right now, even the past or even your current self, but when you're more intentional towards a future self, um, you learn a lot faster. 
uh, your, your views update quicker. Um, and I think that's, to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons I wrote this book. And I think it's one of the reasons I, I, I think that personality tests and things like that are so limiting, not only because they're non-scientific, but because they, they put you too much in a, an identity that then stops you from being flexible towards the future self. So I, I love all that you're saying. And uh, yeah, thanks for letting me be on your show, man. I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about before I go. No, for sure. I want to, uh, well, I want you to kind of, kind of cover this. You, you said you're going to cover in the book, um, or, or you do cover in the book, why you should measure your progress from how much you've grown rather than uh, what you lack. What's the process of that? Because one thing that we come across so often in just in society in general is what I would consider a naysayer, basically somebody who's honestly that the rest of the world is defining you by what you lack. And so how do you inside of yourself choose to ignore the rest of the world as defined by what you lack and say, look, I'm going to define myself by, by what I've, how much I've grown. How do you, how do you internally make that so concrete that other, the, the rest of the world's um, def definition of what you lack doesn't affect you? Cause I think that's where most people get caught up is that yeah they want to define themselves by how much they grow then they talk about how much they grow and all people see is what they lack so how do you concrete that opinion of yourself inside so you aren't affected as much by out outer surroundings and circumstances yeah it's important to know that unless you're first off explicit about what you're striving for so you know i'm going to answer this question in a few ways first off if you're clear on your future self and you're telling people about who that person is, which for a lot of people takes courage because a lot of people, they say that the number one deathbed regret is that you didn't have the courage to pursue what you really wanted. And instead you lived the life that you thought was other people's expectations. So if you generally make it a practice to continuously clarify your future self and then tell everyone in your world that that's what you're going for, they will start to notice the changes more because they'll see you either advancing towards that goal or not. If they don't know what your goals are, then they have no clue what you're advancing towards. And so you're not even training their selective attention towards what you're trying to accomplish. And so if you're telling people, yeah, I'm going to become a podcaster, for example, after they've seen 100 shows, they're going to be like, dude, you've been doing it. Congrats. But if you never tell your people around you what you're up to, then they have no way to measure your progress. Like is all they can see is who you are. And it's usually we're quite lazy. Usually we, uh, we um, you know, I, it's easy just to see the person you're hanging out with your brother as you've always seen him. And you will actually, you know, this is why they say labels create tunnel vision is because when you, when you see a person a certain way and you've categorized them in an overly simplified way, you will, no, you will not notice when all, all the times in the category is not correct. Um, and that's true of yourself and of other people. That's, that's why it's, it's easy to miss, especially when your own, when yourself is changing because it's so incremental over time, but it's also easy to fail to not notice the change that's happening in others. Like I have, you know, five kids, three of them we adopted. And um, it's easy to miss all the amazing growth that's already occurred in them. Like if you're just focused on the gap and you're focused on what they're lacking, then that's all you're going to see. But if you actually take the time to be like, holy cow, Caleb actually, like my son Caleb's now 12. It's like, holy cow, he's a totally different person than he was when we got him. Like he can, he's so good at reading. Like if you actually notice and you take the time to train your, your, your mindset, you know, to focus on the gains and you can do that's again a, a reframing process you can do on a daily basis you can start to say what, what was the gains today what changed today what improved today you can start to notice and then encourage that change in others um and it, and it then becomes amazing how much you can see there's another there's another really just simple way to measure the gain and uh, this is something i even encouraged my mother-in-law to do recently um just because they're staying with us is um journaling so in, in the front of all of my journals i so i go through about a journal a month but in the front of all my journals i say like what were the wins from the last 90 days you know and like literally if you think about even in the last 30 days what are all, all of the things that you've done that have been positive or that have moved you forward if you take even just positive personal experiences could be like i went on a date with my wife but if you take the time to literally just write down on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis all the things that occurred you will start to see that a lot more is happening than you really noticed. And uh, I do, I, I like doing it. I do it all the dang time, but on a quarterly basis, you get shocked at how much actually occurs in a 90 day period of time, especially if you're living intentionally, especially if you're actually, you have a future self that you're pursuing. Um, you, it becomes quite shocking. 
And, but you need to document it because if you don't, first off, you will forget those memories. It's literally the same thing as documenting what you learned in a book. You will lose those memories and you will underplay what just occurred if you don't take the time to just sketch it. Uh, just write it down. What, what, and, you, and when you then see all the things that have happened, that creates confidence because confidence is based on, on recent progress. And so if you take the time to sketch out all the things that have happened, it will build your confidence, which will then enhance your imagination, which will then expound the vision of your future self. And so if you're doing this all the time, then your confidence is growing and your future self is expanding. So not only are you having a better past, but you're also having a bigger future. I love it. This is what's crazy is I must have learned something from all the books I've read because um, as, as he's saying these things, uh, anybody who's been following me for a long time, uh, a few months ago, I published the fulfillment journal and it's essentially walking people through exactly this. What am I grateful for today? What are my top three things I'm going to get done today? And it's a, it's a morning and night journal and it goes over grateful. What are my top three? What's my intentional way of experiencing fulfillment today? How am I going to serve others today? And then at night, every night, you journal, hey, how did my experience of fulfillment go? What was good about it? And then how in the future am I going to experience more fulfillment? Not what, what did I do wrong? How could I, how could I improve necessarily? Yeah. It's not about that. If you're writing out. Well, that would, act, that would actually code the memory as negative. How you're... If you, how you, if you if you said why did it, what did I do wrong? Exactly. Yeah, I don't want to ask what it wrong. frames. Yeah, it frames the memory as negative that way. <laughs> yeah. So, well, may, may, tell, tell me what. Tell me your thoughts. It's already it's already out. But um, my, my no, it's perfect. What you're doing is perfect. Yeah. My it. objective is to say, okay, what my future self, the next time I experience fulfillment, this type of fulfillment, it's going to be experienced this way, and that's like I'm coding how it's going to be experienced, not everything that didn't work. I'm rewriting a more perfect experience every time. So we're every day we're just launching. And what I found is after you do this, so every month I do a process at the beginning of the beginning of the month for the journal of sitting down for 10 minutes in each section, faith, family, fitness, finance, fun, and say just for 10 minutes, pencil doesn't leave the paper. How do you experience fulfillment in each of these areas? And it's interesting to see over, like, based on what's going on, how that changes. Like, what changes in, in fulfillment? People, uh, especially I see this with mothers. That's my primary demographic that I work with. But there, it's so interesting. Unless there's intentional planning, then you have people who they enter motherhood and the last, like, experience they believe, like, really know of that was for themselves was, like, high school sports or choir or something like that for a large majority of people, that's the last thing they remember. After that, they've been selfless for 15, 20, 30 years and they're so lost. They just don't, cause they can't now 10 years into having children, you can't just like pick up and go play softball. You can't go do all these different things because even though it was fulfilling in that moment, it's just not a reality anymore. And if you didn't intentionally identify or track how you experience fulfillment and at least from a 30 day period of time, you're going to miss so much fulfillment and you're going to be miserable for 20 years where it's so easy to just identify for me fulfillment right now is seeing my kids start to talk or to walk or to get angry or experience like <laughs> how his face works. He, like we'll do something kind and he'll give us like this nasty face because he knows that we laugh when he makes a nasty face. And so he makes his nasty face, which is really a kind face, but he doesn't know the difference yet. So it's just like the cute little things. I would have never thought, yes, that's the main source of fulfillment for me when I was 16 years old. It was not even on my radar, but because I've been able to track it, I know what fulfills me on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And I intentionally am planning fulfillment into my life every day. I love it. I mean, the thing is, is what fulfills you now is different from what fulfilled you when you were 16, even what fulfilled you a year ago. Like you said, it's a, what, what's cool is, is that when you do this daily, as you're explaining, it gets far and far more fine grade. So like, there's a really good quote that I've, I've been thinking about a lot, a lot lately. It's actually from Robert Kiyosaki, but he said, uh, intelligence is the ability to make finer distinctions, finer distinctions. You know, you just get better and better at fine grading your perspectives, uh, your experiences, even your, you know, what you're fulfilled by. But when I write a book, as an example, 
it changes so much every draft I go through. Every time I draft a book, it transforms. And so every time you write down, for example, what fulfills you at this stage, or every time you re rewrite your future self and you just go through this drafting process, it gets more and more refined and it gets better and better. But if you don't take the time to do that on a regular basis, then your vision of your future self may be the same vision you had five years ago because you haven't been going through this drafting process, which is something you do daily and something that you do monthly. And it's, and so you, you can see the change happen a lot faster because you're integrating your learning a lot better. And, and that's really how you build confidence. I mean, your future self can and should be adapting and evolving a lot quicker. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a drafting process. And if you're not doing that regularly, then, then your vision's probably, it's probably not that refined, probably not, not that detailed, probably not that clear, and you're probably not getting the best out of your experiences like what you're describing. So I, I love it. And I, and I see the same thing with my past as well. I mean, to me, it's just refined. It, to me, it's just, it's just drafting. Like that's why when I come up with a vision for what I'm trying to accomplish or even a strategy or a goal, I'm like, this is just one draft. When I go through it again, it's going to change. And, and just not overly thinking that this is how it has to be, but this is the draft. And if I didn't do this draft, I wouldn't be able to clean it up and get the better draft on the next one. Mm -hmm. No, totally. Love it. So we're going to do legacy. Well, first, how can we get access to your book? And how can we support you or engage with you? Um, I know currently, as we're recording this, coronavirus has pretty much stopped um, all big events. Do you do online events? Do you, like, how are you um, accessed if we wanted to have more of your content in our lives. Love it. So yes, I would say first thing to do is get the book either on audible or in any form or fashion. You read the book. This book is going to shock you in a really good way. It's, it's just, it is, <laughs> I can promise you that. Um, as someone who's been studying in this world for a really long time, this book is going to make an impact in many different ways. Um, so yeah, get the book. If you want to learn more, go to benjaminharry.com. I do give away free stuff when you buy the book, free online courses, things like extra, extra content relevant to the book, personalized improvement, but also I provide, you know, my blogs have been read over a hundred million times. Like for people who are interested in either growing a platform, et cetera, I give away a free course that I've sold many a time for over a thousand dollars. So there's plenty of goodies and giveaways. Uh, all my blogs are on my website. And so yeah, that's how you can learn more. Benjaminharry.com, but definitely get the book. Yeah, no, I love it. And just for everybody who thinks, ah, free is not worth it. Look, go through the free content. This is what I've learned of meeting um, multiple, uh, I, I don't know what else, how else to call them other than like high performance thinkers and, and experts. Um, if you think, oh, I just wish I could meet my idol, but you've done zero to prepare yourself to ask him important questions, you're going to get there and you're going to be asking questions that are so basic. Um, that he's given that content away for free for decades. It, he, and this isn't a bad thing, but often they don't even really think very often on that frequency anymore. Like the, what, Oh no, they don't. How, don't. How they would answer your question. I, I'm just telling you, even with willpower doesn't work. I'm not the same person that wrote that book. Like exactly. literally that was three years ago. I wouldn't, the current me would not write that book. Um, you know, again, I love the quote by Landa Button. If you're not embarrassed by who you were 12 months ago, you wouldn't, you know, if you're, if you're not embarrassed by who you were 12 months ago, you didn't learn enough. Um, yeah, yeah, if you're, whoever you're meeting, whoever you, who, whoever you've been studying, like if someone, I'm just going to be honest, I haven't written many blog posts since 2018. Like people who are reading my blogs are not even, they have no clue who the current me is. Um, Personalized and permanence there, and I'm going to start writing new blogs, but like, yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Their their mindset, their thinking, their goal. Again, your future self is not the same as your former self. <laughs> and so, when you meet someone, their their head's going to probably be in a totally different place. And if you're not aware of their context, you're going to miss what they're up to. So, you, what you're saying is so right. I mean, I I experience it, and this may for better or worse. I experience it at church all the time, where it's like my view of just uh, of just how to operate in the world creates uh, it so that half of the conversations or a lot of things people talk about from a religious perspective, I'm like, man, does that, that like, I want to participate in this discussion, but to participate, I would have to go back to like re-explain how you learned the primary things of, of your, your religious base so that now you can understand what I think um, about the, the question you're asking me. So it's like, I end up oftentimes just like, well, I don't know really how to, I don't know how to say this. If I say this, what I'm thinking right now, nobody will get, everybody will, eyes will be glazed over like, okay, whatever, moving on because it just won't connect because they, I'm coming from a completely different framework of understanding of 
of life, not just religion, but life in general and how life operates. And so that's going to happen. So just prepare yourself, do what you can to, to prepare yourself, take advantage of all the free content. There's a reason we put that out there. It's so that um, by the time you do get in, in touch with us and have a conversation, you can actually have a conversation with us. We want to engage with you. I know I do. I'm sure Ben, ben does as well. But it just won't be much engagement if you're trying to engage us five years ago today. I mean, just it's not to be mean. We're not intentionally rude. It just doesn't work um, very yeah. well. I mean, I would also, I would also say um, I'm in the middle of writing a book called Who Not How, which is a book I'm writing with Dan Sullivan. But one of my mentors uh, and just good friends, his name's Joe Polish, who's just a genius with people. One of the things he always says is you should never engage in a, in a relationship if you don't come at the relationship, first off, with the right context, which is what you're talking about, and then second off, providing relevant value first. Uh, you know, the first thing you do is provide value to the person you're trying to create a connection with, relevant value, not just value you think is relevant, but like you need to know, you know, do your homework, get to know the situation, get to know where they're at, and then when you provide relevant value and make their future better and try to be a hero to them and what they're trying to accomplish, you can connect with almost anyone. Yep, I completely agree. Okay, so two two quick well the two quick sections here. One is called Legacy on Rapid Fire. One word to one sentence answers. I know it's difficult. Um, the first question though, I do believe needs to be a um, a descriptive answer, not a one word answer. Because too many people say myself, and it just doesn't cut it. What about yourself? Is is this is the answer here? So, um, you ready for Legacy on Rapid Fire? Let's do it. Okay, so what do you believe is holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy today? Um, lack of commitment to my future self. Uh, one other thing is um, lack of investment towards the priorities of my future self. One of them being my kids. Like I, I prioritize them, but I don't act as my future self in every situation I'm in. Very easy with career, with kids, easy to be in routine mode, subconscious mode. And so lately I've been, that probably wasn't a word, one word, but uh, anyways, I, I'm really trying to be intentional in all areas, you know, like thinking, you know, so when I go home, drive home today, like it's really important for me to think what kind of energy do I want to bring into this environment rather than just coming home as I always do. Like, how do I want my kids to experience me? Like, so I'm really working on being more intentional in the key areas that I know will also be true of my future self and also trying to eliminate the areas that are not true of my future self. And I, I still have priorities right now that, and preferences that I know are just out of alignment. Love it. That's a, that's a, that's a huge answer. Go back and re-listen to that over and over and over and ask yourself the, the questions about where, where are you not in alignment? What does your future self want? And what are you doing today to, to help move that forward? What so, do you currently prefer that your future self doesn't prefer? Yeah, absolutely. So what do you believe the hardest thing you've ever accomplished has been? Oh, man. Probably, and memory is a different thing. You know, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure that uh, serving the mission, which you know about, was probably. It doesn't feel as hard as I think the PhD was probably the hardest, to be honest. Um, writing personality was very difficult. Getting to where we're at with our kids is very difficult. But I would say probably since it's recency bias, my person uh, PhD was probably the toughest. Awesome. Okay, and uh, what do you think your greatest success at this point in your life has been? Probably my family, for sure. My, uh, my wife, my five kids, just having a successful family. We have a great family, far from perfect. I came from a pretty tough background. Um, and yeah, I think that is something I don't see an enormous amount of, you know, even in the business world, things like that. Like I just have a great wife, great kids, and my life will continue to get better in that, in that area. Awesome. And what do you think... If you were to highlight one of your one one secret that you believe contributes the most to your success, what would that be? Uh, I mean, aside from journaling, which we've talked a lot about, probably you know this is more of a religious one, but you know, tithing, honestly, like or just generous donations. Like there, there was a story that I heard, and I'll be interested in your perspective on this as a financial advisor. Um, I've actually written about this before, but there's a story that really influenced my thinking. Again, I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on this because this is a very non-conventional approach. But stories of a guy named George Q. Cannon, 
And basically, he paid tithing not in retrospect, which is what most people do. Most people, they pay tithing or give generous donations based 10% on what they've already made. Um, George Q. Cannon paid tithing 10% what he wanted to make in the future. And so he paid his tithing or his generous donations to his church or whatever he did in future form so that it was more of a 10x investment rather than a 10% uh, cost. <laughs> Yeah. And I've been doing that for the last few years and it literally has 10 X my income. That's awesome. Yeah. I would, uh, I don't think there's any problem with that. I, for my, my, I'm not saying that that's how you should do it. No, no. And, and I'm not, I'm not saying either. I'm, I don't make recommendations or anything on the show, but the one, the one thing I would say is from a quantum physical perspective, it, 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 it aligns up with the idea that, um, across all religions, um, tithing or charitable contribution is necessary in, in the, it puts you into a state, a, a mental state of, I have enough to, to give. And when you have enough, you, it forces you into love and abundance and out of fear and scarcity. So the, the very act of giving forces yeah. you out of fear and scarcity. And so the more that you believe you're able to live in a love and abundance, Thus, again, and, and the law of attraction is at play, but I think it's the reverse of what most people think the law of attraction is. You're thus attracted to more wealth because you believe that you can be wealthier and that you have enough. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I have giving charitable donations to whatever form you want. Could be honestly giving money to someone on the street. Like recently I was in an Uber and a lady, I just loved the Uber driver so much. She was like this 50-year-old single mom who was trying to pay for her kids for college. You know, and she told me she, like that she wanted to go back to college, but she had this bill that would, it's, and so I decided to just support her through that bill so that she could start back in the school. And like, so it doesn't have to always be to like, a, it could be to individuals or organizations, but I do explain in the book specifically on the subject of subconscious, how giving money away, uh, it does change your subconscious. It does everything you were just describing it. it it, it puts you in a mindset where you, you do know you have enough, but also you know you can have more. And so it's, it's, really, it's been really big for me. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I love it. So here's the last question, and then, then we're going to end. But uh, we have to pretend it's multiple generations from now. So six generations, your great, 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 great grandchildren um, are sitting around a table talking about you. You're dead, but you get the opportunity to come back and kind of view, look in, or listen into this conversation. What do you want your great, 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 great grandchildren to be saying about you six generations from now? Wow. That's such a cool question, dude. Um, just that he was, um, you know, obviously a, a very good human being, you know, good spiritual man. Um, I mean, I think those are the main ones. I mean, obviously I want to be considered like a learner and someone who is a good teacher and someone who is a great father and someone who was, you know, who, who made a positive impact on the world and also, you know, a positive impact on my, on my posterity. But I, I, I want that, I want to be considered a very faithful person, someone who really just loved God and did, did the right thing, but did very well as well, as far as, as a learner and as a teacher and as someone who blessed a lot of people's lives. Awesome. I love it. And if you've listened to this podcast and you know, that's in alignment with who he's currently is and who his future self is that he's striving to be, Get more clarity on that. Write it down. Who's that, who's that future self going to be in six generations from now? That's a freaking cool question. I'm going to journal on that one, my friend. The yeah. six generations is kind of an interesting concept. It, it is. Why six? Why six? So, so I started with 200 years, but 200 years is just too far out for most people. But like, if you think back 200 years, who, who do we remember? George Washington, over the last 200 years, George Washington, your, probably your religious leaders, Thomas Jefferson, um, and Abraham Lincoln, you remember like some big key players, but how many presidents have there been of the United States? And this is just the United States. There's been a lot of presidents and we remember maybe a handful, most people. Um, and then if you think about the world, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, right? We remember the big, big players who had impact. But here's the other thing. And this is why, I, this is the whole purpose of Fuel Your Legacy. I want people to intentionally be, you said it earlier, that the main regret is people who didn't live courageous enough to do what they wanted and, and now they're regretting it. I believe that if you're intentionally planning your legacy, you can have it. You can't get to the end of your life and say, man, I wish I hope people remember me this way, the ultimate version of who you think you could have been. No, you have to live that every day to, to leave a legacy. You live a legacy to leave a legacy. And 
the uh, so a, a big example that I use when I'm teaching people about this is: Do you know who built Mount Rushmore? Who carved their faces on the side of the mountain? No. Why? Because no. was it not that it was a big goal? Was it not that it was massive? A achievement, none of that. It was that they didn't tell people that they were doing it. There was no transparency. And you alluded that for you to measure growth and stay in a growth perspective rather than what you lack perspective, you have to let people know what you're doing. And so there's a lot of people who have That's done one of the most things, biggest keys. Done incredible things, probably as big or bigger than George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or whatever, but they are never going to be known because they didn't share it. And and the and people would think, well, I don't care if people remember who I am. Look, it's not about people remembering who you are. It's about people being changed and moved to identify that type of person inside of themselves and to do something great as well. It's not so I can have this big amount of recognition and be a superstar. It's so that other people can see inside of themselves this was an average, ordinary person who did extraordinary things. And how can I do that in my own life now? We need more examples of success. So that's why the whole this is the I love it of Fuel Your Legacy. So I love your question. I'm excited to hear what you'll be in six generations from now. What I like about the question is that it allows you to live in the future right now. You know, it allows you to essentially fast forward your experience so that you're living. I mean, you could technically, because perception is kind of where we're at, you can be living that far into the future where you're living six generations into the future. Like literally, you could be living that way right now because you're creating the, the experience of your future posterity like you could be doing that and you actually are doing that right now they may not remember you like you just said but if you are living that far into the future then the things you'll be it, again it goes back to the bigger the future the better the present um but like the goal shapes the process and so if if that's your goal and you're living that far ahead then it's going to change everything about what you're doing today so it's i think it's freaking cool it's a way you know i, I love it cool well you, I, you should you should read my book you should read my book slipstream time hacking by the way i think you you you, you yourself would freak out about that book. That's, okay, that's an what? ebook I wrote several years ago, but just hearing everything about what you're saying, you'd, you'd like that book. What, what is it called again? It, it's, a, it's got an odd title, but it's called Slipstream Time Hacking. And it's, it's very similar to what you're describing as far as how to, you know, how to, you know, uh, have you ever seen the, the movie uh, Interstellar by uh -huh. Christopher Nolan? You know, like the concept of wormholes? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's about how to jump through wormholes and get, Get to where you want to go way faster. Get yourself 50 years, 100 years into your own future. Yeah. No, I love it. This is like, this stuff amps me up. I get so excited about this stuff. I'm so happy that uh, you're on our podcast. And it's fun. Now this audience gets to hear from you uh, personally. Go get his books, guys. Like, he's invested time, not for himself. I mean, definitely for himself. He's growing through this process and he's documenting it for us. Um, that's, that's the way I view my writings at least. Yes. I want to give to other people, but I'm just documenting my life. And what I don't realize if I stay in my own bubble is how far I've come. And then you go have a conversation with somebody and you're like, Oh man, you could really benefit from this. Or they're like, how do you think that way? And you're like, Oh, I didn't document that process good enough. And I've been guilty of that multiple times. And so I've started documenting the process so I can publish it. So that other people can have those same transformations that I had. Um, so go read his books and, and, and be willing to follow his, his blogs because uh, it's going to change your life. There's going to be links here in the, in the, um, in the show notes to, to get it on his website uh, where you'll be able to get everything. Sounds like that's the main hub for you. BenjaminHardy.com. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much. Super appreciate it and stay safe. Enjoy your family and work hard. Thanks, brother. It's fun. We'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.